This is episode 21. We'll be dealing with the topic of landscape today, and this is part of my continuing series of virtual photography workshops for local guides. First thing we should talk about is landscape is huge. It's massive. It's everything around us. In this shot, out in the Grampians, in Western Victoria, you can certainly see the close foreground hill, the distant lake, and the really distant mountains further on. There's quite a lot of interest in the sky with the clouds. The composition is still rule of thirds, and it's got some really interesting colours, and the mists introduce a new element. Mists are often present in landscape. You either get used to them, or you use tools to get rid of them if you don't like them. Lightroom has a dehaze tool, for example, which can be quite good at this. This shot is telephoto, 80mm, 200 ISO, and f8. We'll talk more about that later. So more about huge. So our imagination, when we're talking about photographs, makes up most of what we see. So out in the real world, we see a lot more detail, perhaps detail that's not actually there. So the view from our camera often disappoints us. This means we need to use tricks, or I suppose more correctly techniques, to help the viewer. One choice is wide lens or telephoto lens. You may remember from the earlier tutorials, wide lenses capture a lot. Telephotos narrow the view. So if you're using a wide lens, it brings in the whole view of everything you're looking at. So in my camera, my widest lens uh, starts at seven millimeters and I can go right up to pretty much anything I want really out of the series of lenses I've got. Most phones tend to be around six to eight millimeters, but their sensor is quite close, so their effective field of view is probably closer to what you see with your eyes, which is 35 millimeter. So it's just an interesting thing that 35 millimeters is really close to what the human eyes see. Now a wide lens makes distant features seem small. And if there's nothing in your foreground, that can give you a bit of a problem because it makes your images boring as well. Wide also gives the feeling of a vast, distant solitude, so it can give peace and serenity. And as I mentioned a moment ago, your background can seem a little far away. So wide needs a foreground anchor. So if we talk about anchors for a moment, and this shot might surprise you, this is New York on the island of Manhattan looking from Brooklyn, just on the waterfront there, very close to where the Brooklyn Bridge is. Now, you might not think this is a landscape. There's hardly any trees. In fact, in New York, there's no trees. Um, and it's just city buildings. It's still a landscape. It's the same concepts. The buildings are just the mountains. The water in the, wa in the foreground is just a river. This shot's 12 millimeter, And you can kind of follow the shadow or the reflection of that centre building off into the buildings, but your eye doesn't have anywhere to settle, it doesn't have anywhere to go. This image is unsatisfying to me. So if we introduce an anchor into our wide shot, so in this case we start with the, the rocky pebbly beach in front of me, we follow around the breakwater onto the left, we have a look at the nice carousel, Jane's carousel, and then up onto the fantastic Brooklyn Bridge with its amazing stonework and that web of cables. If you ever get a chance to go to New York, go walk over that bridge. It's just a, a really cool experience. And there's so many different photographic opportunities for shapes and colours and light. You'll need to go there at least 20 times in different times of the day to, to uh, fully appreciate it. But this shot, like the last one, 12mm, 200 ISO, 140th, F9. So it's almost the same shot, but in this one with the anchors and with the bridge providing a nice line to drag your eye over into the city buildings it's much easier to see what's going on. There's also a little bit of foreground interest with the carousel off to the left. There's hardly any detail to look at but you can certainly tell it's a carousel and there's a little boat in the foreground that just gives you something else to look at and the uh, tugboat and its big barge. It's probably a barge full of garbage. When we're looking at big wide landscapes like this one back in the Grampians in Western Victoria in Australia again, I've used an anchor here to 
combat the vastness of this plane looking off into the distant mountains. Without the anchor, this would just be a blotch of green with a blotch of blue and the moon on top. With the anchor, it gives you some interest for your eye in the foreground, and then your eye heads off into the distance and appreciates the valley and the plain and the mountains. Again, 12mm f8. Now monochrome changes the world. So if we just pop back to that other image for a moment, and this one. Back here, and this one it completely changes the way the world looks. I really like what monochrome does in landscape images. It gives you a new appreciation for what's actually there and you see things that you couldn't even see before. In this image you tend not to appreciate this framing around here. But in this one it's really apparent. Some of the mist even seems to go away even though I didn't really process the mist out of this image. We should talk about f-stops. So the f-stop in this case is the size of the aperture and the lazy way, and I often do it because I'm lazy, is f8. f8 is a, a nice halfway point that gives you a mostly sharp image from edge to edge from front to back. The trick is to focus about one third of the way into the scene so that you pick up the sharp range being most of the image. So f 8s good and gives you a good sharpness so why not go to f32? Well, on most cameras, especially smaller sensor cameras, and that might be a, a 1.6 or a 1.3 crop sensor, or it might be a mirrorless like I use, which is a, a two times crop sensor, or your phone, uh, those cameras tend to struggle at anything above about f11 or so. It's not the same with every camera, so you need to make sure that you understand what yours does. So experiment with the lens or lenses that you want to use and your camera. Zoom right into the resulting images and look for the edge to edge sharpness. So you want it to be sharp over here, over here, down here, up here and in the middle. Watch the corners because often with uh, some cameras and lens combinations you'll get a lot of darkness in your corners and that's because the lens isn't really doing the full imaging circle onto the sensor. Zoom in and look for chromatic aberration. So that's the green and red fringing on the edges, or if you've got an iPhone purple. Uh, that aberration is really unattractive in an image, and you'll be surprised how much you can see it even when you're looking at a big version of the image. It just attracts your eye and it's yuck. So going over F8, you may find that that aberration starts to come into your image and starts to get worse, particularly in low light situations. So I talked about the two different choices, wide and telly, and it doesn't have to be a big telly, so I'll often go to 32mm or 40mm or something like that, so I'm just slightly into the telly range, but it makes the distant features seem a whole lot closer. It means you've got less reliance on the foreground, so you don't necessarily need that anchor, and you've actually got to be a little bit careful if you're going with a, a deep telly, if you went to 100mm or 150 if you bring an anchor into that shot it'll actually look awful. And it allows you artistic freedom, it allows you some composition instead of just everything. So remember the wide image, the wide lens, it just gets you everything. And when I say wide means everything, it gets you a lot. So this image is very busy. Trees, Nevada Falls, the various mountains of Yosemite in the background there. Still lots of nice action happening up in the sky but it's everything. Now I still like the image, but it's everything. This one, only 36 millimeters. So the difference between 12 and 36 and a slight recomposition is massive. It means that the big rock to the left, which I think is half dome, but don't shoot me in the comments if I'm wrong, um, that one takes up most of the image. You see that first. It grabs your eye, but then your eye tends to run down the slope of the mountain, so it tends to run down here, and then we see the waterfall. And that, to me, is the main part of this image, is that beautiful waterfall. And again, one of my favourite photographers, you can probably guess who, he used monochrome a lot, and I understand why. It really does change the world. 
going from this image where well you can sort of see the striation in the rocks coming down here you can see some of these features where the ledges and things are wouldn't that be awesome to climb but when you come into the monochrome one it's so much clearer all that detail in the rock really really stands out the trees are less of a contrast they get darker but they're also not taking your eye away from that beautiful rock and you start to see all of those features so color monochrome I know which one I like better. It is a personal taste thing though, you may not feel the same. You can do landscapes at night time, you don't see it very much, but I like doing it. Uh, in this case the landscape was painted red by the tail lights of my, my vehicle. Um, it was actually an accidental effect that I discovered as the image developed. You do have to watch some things though, you'll discover that there is a little bright green light down here in the background. It would be much better to get rid of that in post-processing, but I left it in so I could show it to you. And it's a bit distracting having that there. But you still see the, the beautiful granite cliffs of Yosemite, because they're, they're reflective even of just moonlight. And this one's a 60 second image at f5.6. And again, Look at the difference monochrome made. Now, it's made two amazing differences here. One is attractive and one isn't. The one that's not attractive, let's address that first. Those weeds in the foreground now, they're awfully bright. To me, they wreck the image. So, in this one, you'd be much better off either dulling them down or cropping it across the dark line there and just having this sort of area, perhaps, as the image itself. But, as you can see, monochrome, massive difference to the world again. Same shot, monochrome, huge difference. And the reason that you get that huge difference is monochrome lends itself to bringing in a lot more contrast. If you brought in that much contrast in a colour image, it would look pretty awful. But in this one, it looks much better. So just to recap, landscape, huge. And it doesn't just mean when you're out in the bush, it means in the city as well. And that's why it's pretty relevant to local guides, because we shoot cityscapes, we shoot parks, we shoot beaches, we shoot everything, and we add those things to the places that are on maps. So think about your images. Wide means everything. Make sure you anchor something in the foreground so that you have a feeling and you give your eye somewhere to go through the image. Don't make it confusing. So nice clear path into whatever you want people to look at. The telephoto helps you compose, lets you have some artistic discretion about the way your image is set up because it's not everything it's part of it now telephotos also compress our distances so they make things that are out there seem very close to us and they can shave many many kilometers or miles depending on your preference off the image and they make it seem like you're right there right next to it and it's a really cool thing it's good to take advantage of that and remember monochrome changes the world but also remember monochrome is not for maps images. Maps images that go up in monochrome tend to get removed and made private. So monochrome for you, colour for maps. Thanks a lot for another episode. This has been number 21. Thanks for watching and I'd love for you to subscribe and uh, click the little bell so you know when I put up a new video. Thanks a lot. See you next time.